Steve, Richard, and uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's a privilege to have this opportunity uh, to talk about this uh, most important subject. Um, I have pre three preliminary remarks that I'd like to make before I get into the heart of my argument. And the first one is that the uh, doctrine of the intermediate state is a surface issue. Uh, the more deep issue is whether or not substance dualism of some sort is true. That is to say, if there is a soul that is a spiritual substance uh, that is different from the body. That's the fundamental issue that is at stake in the literature between Christian physicalists and Christian dualists and the, those who affirm or deny the intermediate state. Um, uh, given Christian theism, uh, substance dualism almost entails uh, an intermediate state. Um, it will, I'll make a point about that later. The second preliminary is that substance dualism of a generic sort uh, which uh, has been the view of the church for 2,000 years, as has uh, the overwhelming majority uh, embraced a disembodied intermediate state between death and resurrection. Craig Keener, uh, N.T. Wright, and I believe the majority, though I'm not sure of this, of New Testament scholars today would agree with Wright when he says that there's life after life after death, meaning that there's a disembodied intermediate state uh, after death and a general resurrection in the future. Now, um, uh, biblical scholars are confused about this, many, many of them, because while substance dualism, I think, is very clearly taught in Scripture, I think John Cooper has, uh, has demonstrated this. Um, biblical scholars deny this regularly. Uh, a classic example is uh, five to ten years ago, N.T. Wright delivered a paper at Fordham University to the Society of Christian Philosophers. You can find it online. In that paper, uh, Wright says that substance dualism is not taught anywhere in the Bible and it is an utterly foreign concept to Christianity. Now, he's already written the hernia inducing the resurrection of the Son of God. Uh, if you ever try to pick that thing up, be careful. <laughs> and uh, in other books where he has defended the <clears throat> fact that when we die, we leave our bodies and exist in an intermediate state while we await a resurrected body. So you read the paper and he says substance dualism is just not Christian. But then he goes on and in first uh, uh, treats 2 Corinthians 5 and uh, uh, the passage where Paul says, I may have been out of my body, I don't know, and says it's very clear that when we die, we leave our bodies. So what, what gives here? Why do biblical scholars so often deny substance dualism? Well, the answer is that Wright has never studied philosophy. And he is confusing platonic dualism with substance dualism. There are at least five different versions of substance dualism that is being embraced today and that has been embraced throughout the history of the church. Nobody believes in platonic dualism anymore. And so the point is that he is rejecting platonic dualism, thinking he's rejecting substance dualism, and that's just a, a, that is a non sequitur. I reject platonic dualism, but I hold to a particular version of substance dualism. I do not believe, and I hope this will come up in the Q&A, that the early uh, church fathers inappropriately read platonic dualism into the scriptures or anything like that. So that's my second preliminary. Third preliminary, um, neuroscience has absolutely nothing to say on this subject. It is utterly irrelevant. Um, the, uh, let me explain. We've discovered that if mirror neurons don't fire, a person can't feel empathy. But there are three empirically equivalent theories that are consistent with those data, which means they're consistent with exactly the same observations. One was be strict physicalism, that a feeling of empathy is just the same thing as the firing of mirror neurons. 
The second would be property dualism, which says, no, 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 no. A feeling of empathy has features that aren't features of uh, brain states. The brain state causes the feeling of empathy, uh, and both occur in the brain. The third view, which I hold, is that a uh, a firing of mirror neurons occurs in the brain, a feeling of empathy occurs in the soul, and while the soul is embodied, just as while I'm driving a car, if the car breaks down, I can't move around town if I'm locked inside the car. That doesn't prove I'm the car. So just because there is a dependency relation between mirror neurons and brain states uh, and, and mental states, as says nothing about the nature of the feeling of empathy or what has it. That's why two years ago when I was invited by a person I did not know, a research biologist at the National Institute of Health in Bethesda, Maryland, to come to give a lecture because he had read some of my writings on defending the soul, I spoke to a group of about 130 or so neuroscientists, and I defended uh, 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 two theses, but the first one was, that when it comes to the ontological question of what is consciousness and what possesses and unifies it, you have nothing to say about that subject as neuroscientists. And I mean absolutely nothing. Well, there was a 45 minute Q&A after an hour lecture and I got no pushback on that whatsoever. Because neuroscience is good at establishing detailed correlations and dependency relations between mental states and brain states. But it is, in principle, incapable of answering questions about what is consciousness and what is the self. I hope we talk about that in the Q&A. So those are my three preliminaries. <clears throat> and what I want to do then is I want to defend substance dualism, because it's my view that um, even if the scriptures do not teach a disembodied intermediate state, there's enough evidence to believe it's true whether the Bible teaches it or not. And so what the scriptures teach is ultimately irrelevant to this question unless the Bible teaches that a disembodied intermediate state is false. Then we have to go with scripture. But if scripture is silent on the question or ambiguous, <clears throat> or there are some people who hold one view and some hold another and it's hard to tell what the Bible says, then we're free to follow the evidence wherever it goes under those conditions. And the evidence is strong enough to believe in a disembodied intermediate state without explicit biblical teaching, though, as I said, the Bible is clear on this and it has been for 2,000 years. So what I want to do now is, I hope you understood what I said. I'm not saying we're free to disregard Scripture. I'm saying under the specific conditions that it's ambiguous and not clear, oh, and I don't believe those conditions have been met, I think the evidence supports it anyway, given Christian theism. So what I want to do is I want to provide reasons to believe that there's a soul or that substance dualism is true. Now, what is substance dualism? <clears throat> well, I'm going to be using it generically as we did in our recent uh, Blackwell Companion to Substance Dualism that was published about 10 months ago uh, that I edited with uh, two other gentlemen. And in that book, we define substance dualism in the following way. There is a spiritual, non-physical self. You can call it a soul, a mind, an ego, a self. And it is not identical to the body. It is different from the body. As a Christian theist, I would go on and say it is the, let's just call it soul, that is the locus of personal identity, and it's what makes me me after death and on into the future. So that is substance dualism with a Christian flair. And why believe that there is a soul? I want to give you uh, uh, five quick reasons. And uh, that'll give you a chance to have plenty to shoot at during the Q&A. Number one, divisibility. Every material object is divisible or can exist as a percentage of its original self. Thus, this podium can be divided in half or there can be 80% of a podium if we took 20% away. 
The brain and the body are the same way. In some operations, 55% uh, of the brain is removed. In patients with Dandy Walker syndrome, they have 10% of a brain. It's a sheath of brain tissue uh, near the skull. The entire inside of the brain cavity is filled with a sack of fluid, and they lead uh, 90, 80 to 90% normal lives. Now, in those cases, you don't have 10% of a person. After an operation, when a person loses 85% of their brain, you don't have 85, uh, uh, 55%, you don't have 45% of a person. Persons are all or nothing kinds of things. Uh, they're not capable of being divided. They can in functioning, and they can gain and lose functioning, but they don't gain and lose themselves. Persons are wholes, and they're all or nothing. That's because they're not composed of what is called separable parts, and thus they're indivisible. Number two, you and I and human beings are possibly disembodied. That disembodied existence might be true. Um, <clears throat> Near-death experiences, in my opinion, there have been uh, 300 million around the world, there have been uh, 14 million in America in the last 30 years. I've done the research on this, and the scholars who've studied this have indicated that the evidence for near-death experiences is overwhelming. And it, John Burke's book, Imagine Heaven, shows that 95% of these are consistent with Scripture. But I don't need near-death experiences to be real. I just need for them to be possibly real. I and Peter Kreeft and Gary Habermas did a six-hour debate with Michael Shermer, uh, Victor Stinger, and uh, a philosopher uh, uh, named Keith Parsons, and it was uh, at New Orleans Baptist Seminary, uh, and it was on whether uh, uh, life after death was true, and uh, they all made their case based upon an assessment of the evidence. But look what that tells you. That means that they were granting that this might be true. That it was possibly true. Now nobody's going to watch a Dateline NBC uh, trying to present the evidence that somebody discovered square circles in Montana. Uh, be because we know ahead of time that that is not even possible. So there is something true of me I am possibly, I'm the kind of thing that is metaphysically possibly disembodiable, but my brain and body are the kinds of things for which they're not even possibly disembodiable. Even God could not make my brain and body exist in a possible world disembodied. So there is something true of me that's not true of my brain and body, Namely, I am possibly disembodiable, even if I'm never actually disembodied. This shows that I cannot be my brain and body. I have to be something immaterial and non-physical. The fourth, uh, the third argument is the libertarian free will. Um, libertarian, even if you're a Calvinist, a lot of Calvinists have believed that when it comes to Salvation, maybe we don't have libertarian free will, but when it comes to ordinary choices of uh, Richard Miller made the, made the case that for the history of Calvinism, when it came to ordinary choices, that we did have libertarian free will, like whether I'm going to watch a football game or whether I'm going to read a book. We can, when we make those kinds of choices, uh, we, it's up to us. If we do something, we could have done the other thing without anything changing. And so we have the power to exercise freedom, at least in non-religious and non-moral areas. Now, if that's true, we cannot be our brains or bodies or anything physical. Because everything physical undergoes change and events according to strictly deterministic laws of physics. If not, they, they, if you take those indeterministically, then as, as a human body moves over time, the chances of what's going to happen at one moment given another are fixed by, uh, the, by the wave, the probability wave. 
Uh, and by the way, even if there is not synchronic determinism, there's diachronic determinism for the materialist because the whole depends ontologically on the parts in what is called the mariological hierarchy. And so you have bottom-up determinism. The leading philosopher of mind in the world, Jaguan Kimmett Brown, has argued that if you, get, if you have this materialist view, there can be no possibility for mental causation in the world. Thus, any kind of mental causation, including compatibilist, is not possible. But we all know that we act freely occasionally. In my case, it's when my wife lets me. And um, so we all occasionally ask for, uh, act freely. But if that's true, I can't be a material object. I have to be able to transcend the laws of physics and engage in action that is not determined by that or by my material parts. I have to therefore be a spiritual entity. The fourth argument involves the unity of consciousness. When you look at a chest of drawers, <clears throat> like any object that's made up of a new number of parts, um, what happens is that the light waves that hit your retina, your optic nerve, are broken down and, and terminate at different regions of the brain. One region of the brain engages in electrical firings associated with the shape of the chest of drawers. An entirely different region of the brain with its size, a different with its color, a different with its location, a difference regarding whether it's in motion at rest. Now the problem is there is nothing in the brain that puts all these back together into a unified object. It's called the binding problem. And the problem is that the brain is not the kind of object that could unify consciousness so that our conscious experiences are one. They're not scattered where different things have different pieces of my conscious experience. The reason no part of the brain will ever be able to do it is because every part of the brain is divisible and it will distribute different functions of looking at an object or having a visual field to different, to different parts of, that, of the brain. It follows that only a simple object that is not composed of inseparable parts uh, or separable parts would be the sort of thing that can explain the unity of consciousness and why I see a whole chest of drawers as a unity. And that means that only a spiritual substance can explain the unity of consciousness. Fifth and final argument and then a statement. Um, the sameness through change. Physical objects, if they gain and lose parts, do not remain literally the same objects over time. If I took all the parts of this object away and replaced them with frozen green jello, this would not be the same podium. But that's true whether even if I take a small part of it and throw it away and replace it with uh, aluminum. In that case, if we're talking about the podium as a whole and not the 99% remaining, which hasn't lost any parts, then the podium as a whole is not literally the same because a physical object is composed of parts and it can't remain the same through part replacement. But that would mean that if you and I were our brains and bodies, we would not be the same from one moment to the next. Uh, we shouldn't fear going to the dentist because it won't be I that goes to the dentist. Um, and we shouldn't be punished for past actions because it wasn't I, literally, it was a lookalike. Uh, and um, we, we, we are not literally the same over time. The fact is there's nothing more obvious to us that if we hum a tune and we're in the middle of it, I am literally the same self that hummed the first part of the tomb, am humming the present part, and anticipates humming the future part of the, of the tune. Thus, it's obvious that I am literally the same from one moment to the next, but if I were my brain and body, I could not be. Now, I want to close with two, two, two final 
point. So the, but my, my view is that there is a soul. The evidence is extremely strong. And uh, given that we are not annihilated when we die, and given Christian theism, and we continue to exist after death, the soul has to continue on in the intermediate state, uh, given that substance dualism is true. Now, in conclusion, and I don't know Richard well enough to know this applies to him, but Bill Craig made the point that when scientists start making claims that seem to conflict with biblical teaching and solid theology, theologians and biblical scholars start ducking into foxholes, hoisting the red flag of surrender, and trip over each other in the race to see who can be the first to come up with a revisionist view of biblical teaching that placates the scientists. I know that Warren Brown, Joel Green, and Nancy Murphy at Fuller have adopted a neuroscientific hermeneutic to justify their Christian physicalism and a denial of the intermediate state because they think neuroscience has clearly shown um, that you can't be a dualist any longer. I'm tired of biblical revisionism. Um, it's happening all over. There is no reason for it, and I agree with Bill Craig, although that may not be the only reason. Um, the second thing that I want to point out is that I believe it has been established beyond reasonable doubt that the Old Testament teaches disembodied souls. This was recently, uh, in my opinion, uh, demonstrated in a uh, SBL monograph uh, by uh, Richard Steiner called Disembodied Souls, where he does a very technical piece on Old Testament works in the ancient Near East, showing that the idea that at death the soul leaves and the body is behind is an Old Testament teaching. So this is not something that was borrowed from Platonism and I believe that this is the view that the scriptures teach. Thank you. Can you hear me? And now for something completely different. My interpretation of the intermediate state, what happens to a Christian between death and resurrection, has never been influenced by neuroscience. I'll just say that first. Um, it began to be shaped during my undergraduate studies in a Bachelor of Theology program at Jamaica Theological Seminary. Early in my theological studies, I came to realize that the core hope of New Testament eschatology is that at Christ's return, God will raise the faithful to new life and redeem the cosmos, resulting in a new creation. So the realization that resurrection and new creation, you know what happened there? Oh, thank you. Uh, the, the, the realization of resurrection and new creation, not heaven hereafter, is the core biblical hope, has only deepened from my early theological studies, through my years as a campus minister, as I did graduate studies in philosophy with an MA thesis on religious language in Aquinas and Tillich, then biblical studies with a doctorate on humans created as image of God, and it's further deepened through many years of teaching the Bible to laity in the church, to college students, and to seminary students. Also, during my early theological studies, I came to understand that the Bible does not have a bifurcated view of the human person, often called soul and body or spirit and body, such that the soul or the spirit is an immortal part of the person, often identified with the essential person. And I don't deny the book that was just referred to. There are always outliers in any theory, uh, but it's not the dominant view by any means. You get, is it working? We lost it. It lost it again? So. Well, I, I'll, I'll work on it. I'll figure it so out. Okay. You, don't, you have to work. I'll figure it out. Okay. And if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. That's fine. Uh, there's a spirit there, it doesn't need a body. Yeah. <laughs> so categories like um, soul or spirit in opposition to body or materiality may not be defined today in Platonic ways, but to think of them as an immortal part of the person that is the essential person that survives death is an inheritance 
from the history of theology and philosophy, which does not immediately invalidate them, because I don't believe in the genetic fallacy. My issue is that the Bible has a, what I'd call a unified, though multidimensional, and non-reductive view of the person as an integrated, embodied whole. I don't think it has a theory of the person, but it has an understanding of the person. And scripture further understands human beings as having been created mortal, with the ability to attain immortality, something we lost in the fall, so that for us, after the fall, immortality is a future hope, which takes the form of the resurrection of the body, as Paul makes very clear in 1 Corinthians 15. And this unified, essentially embodied understanding of the human person has impacted my view of the possibility of the so-called intermediate state, which often envisions a disembodied soul or spirit going to be with Christ in heaven as we await resurrection. Let me see if I get this working now, because I got a nice slide for, in the, for the next piece. So is that going to show? Yeah, all right. If I had time, I'd go into an exposition of the early chapters of Genesis, which portray the creation of human beings. And these texts are paradigmatic and canonical for our understanding of what it means to be human. What is going on here? Is, is this not plugged in right? I'm just going to leave it, yeah. It's something with the signal. It's something with the signal? When we moved it over there. OK. How's that? It's still gone. All right. Forget about that. But I have some good biblical text up there so you don't have to turn to your Bibles because I want to do some Bible study with you. Um, is there, you want to try to take this to the back or just take it like halfway down or something without change it, you think? We'll just leave it like this. Is it's it going to come and go? It's going, yeah, it keeps coming out. Going. You don't know why? No. Okay. Uh, if I take yeah. out this, I'm not going to do anything. Yeah, when, when I use this in my classrooms, it works all the time. Okay. Um, so I could address the issue of how we tend to read later theological ideas into biblical terms like soul, Hebrew nefesh, in the early chapters of Genesis, a term, by the way, that's applied equally to animals and human beings. Both are created nefesh chaya, living souls. And to say a soul is living is not redundant because in the Bible, in the book of Numbers, nefesh refers to a corpse in some times. The semantic range of nefesh can refer to the person, praise the Lord, oh my soul, that's personal, can refer to a dead body, can refer to normally a living organism, so that when the waters come up to my neck, the seaweed has covered my nefesh. That's where I breathe from. And Greek suche and the adjective sukikos in Paul always has a negative term. It refers to human beings under the auspices of sin to be transformed by spirit, which is not in Paul or in the Old Testament related to immateriality in any way. So whether we discuss an immaterial part of the person, let's not connect it to biblical language, which doesn't mean that. Let's discuss that on other grounds. Terms like suke, soul, nefesh, ruach, and so forth, have their own integral revelatory meaning which ought to have priority over our modern or medieval categories. As Inigo Montoya would say to Vicini and the Princess Bride, you keep using that word, I don't think it means what you think it means. <laughs> and if you're disappointed that I won't be advocating an immortal soul as what guarantees personal identity between death and resurrection, then as the man in black says to Inigo, also in the Princess Bride, get used to disappointment. Now, if I had time, I would track various portrayals of this integrated, essentially embodied nature of the person throughout Old and New Testaments, but I don't have time to do that. But that's my goal with, with students. I try to show them the biblical theology of the text as it spans Old and New Testaments to show what God's purposes are for the renewal of life in this world, that we may live out the Missio Dei, the mission of God in embodied ways in the world, a world that is broken and in need. Because of time constraints, I'm going to focus simply on two New Testament texts that seem to suggest that believers go to heaven immediately at death. And I admit at the outset that these texts and this idea is dear to many Christians throughout the ages. Indeed, I'm actually loath to address the, the topic of the intermediate state, because I don't typically take it upon myself to disabuse my students of their belief in that. I simply teach the distinctive Christian hope of God's intent to renew the world and raise us to new life 
in a new, new creation. And the idea of the intermediate state tends to pale into insignificance by comparison. But you asked me to address this topic, so I'll take up the challenge. When I began researching the topic a few years ago for my book, A New Heaven and a New Earth, for an, a short excursus in that book, I was ready to concede that there might be some sporadic evidence in the Bible for such an intermediate state, even though it was clear that this was not the dominant Christian hope in Scripture. I was initially um, pre prepared to concur with C.S. Lewis when he stated in his book on miracles, the earliest Christian documents give a casual and unemphatic assent to the belief that the supernatural part of a man survives the death of the natural organism. But they're very little interested in this matter. What they're intensely interested in is the restoration or resurrection of the whole composite creature by a miraculous divine act. Now, admittedly, it's a decidedly unbiblical way of putting the matter since there is no supernatural part of a person. We are natural creatures, dependents for our lives on the, on the will of God. But I was nevertheless glad to see that Lewis affirmed that the resurrection or the restoration of the person was the true focus of New Testament eschatology. Like Lewis, I assume that a few biblical texts might in fact portray an interim state for the righteous in advance of their final destiny resurrection. Like Lewis, N.T. Wright, who's been referred to already, has affirmed the validity of an intermediate state, which he thinks, or let me clarify, which he used to think, because I've had conversations with Wright a year ago, uh, was accepted by most first century Jews and the New Testament. He called this at the time life after death, which is why he coined the phrase life after, life after death for resurrection. The Wright's point was that while we may believe in life after death, an intermediate state, presumably in heaven, that's not the genuine Christian hope. And he, even back then when he started talking this language, affirmed that too much concern with the intermediate state can detract from a proper focus, which is that God intends to renew earthly life starting now, because this affects how we live in the world. However, my own study of the New Testament texts that purportedly teach or mention an intermediate state, there are only six of them, convinced me that none of them actually does. I can't deal with all the relevant texts here, for that, you'll have to go read the excursus in my book, New Heaven and New Earth. I'm going to focus on the two most important texts. The first is 2 Corinthians 5, 6 to 8. More than any other New Testament text, this has been used as a basis for blessed hope in heaven immediately after death. Even the literary context of these verses in 2 Corinthians seems to support what we might call an otherworldly orientation. In an extended discussion stretching from 2 Corinthians 4, 8 to 5, 10 as a literary unit, Paul appears to contrast body and life in the present with a heavenly eternal future. And at the end of chapter 4, that's not me, right? <laughs> Unless there's, there's something, a spirit in the body, I don't know. Um, at the end of chapter 4, Paul speaks of our outer nature wasting away while our inner nature is being renewed in, chapter, in verse 16. And he contrasts in verse 18 what is seen and transitory with what is unseen and eternal. So it makes perfect sense then that in chapter 5, Paul would say, so we're always confident, even though we know that while we're at home in the body, we're away from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight. Yes, we do have confidence, and we'd rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. Now, have I just got myself into a bit of a jam here? Because what does Paul clearly say? He seems to emphasize a non-earthly, non-embodied future with Christ. Doesn't he say he'd prefer to be at home with the Lord, presumably in heaven, than in his present body on earth? Doesn't this clearly teach the hope of heaven that begins immediately at death when we're separated from our bodies? No. First thing we should note is that Paul has already stated in the first four verses of chapter 5, that his actual hope is for what he calls a heavenly dwelling that God has prepared for him. That's a resurrection body. That's a non-controversial interpretation. All the commentaries accept that. Speaking of the contrast between the present body and the resurrection body, Paul says, for we know that if this earthly tent is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this tent we groan, longing to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling, if indeed we've taken it off, we will not be found naked. For while we're still in this tent, we groan under our burden because we do not wish to be unclothed, 
but to be further clothed so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. And he who's prepared us for this very thing is God, who has given us the spirit as a guarantee. So using the metaphor of a body, the body as a house or dwelling, Paul, as a good Jew, says that he doesn't want to be naked or unclothed, that is, disembodied in the eschaton, but rather to be clothed with a new resurrection body, a building or dwelling prepared by God, hence not made with hands. While the resurrection is future, Pauline theology affirms that if we have died with Christ, we have been raised with him already. We participate in the resurrection. And part of the grounding for that is that Paul affirms that we already have, in some sense, the hoped for building or dwelling in the heavens. We have that already. It is guaranteed, and it's being made or prepared by God. This language of what, something being prepared in heaven to be manifest on earth at the last day is part of a pervasive pattern in the New Testament that I have addressed in a subsection of my book, uh, New Heaven and New Earth. This is just a chart from the book. You may not be able to see it here. But among the things that the New Testament says are being prepared or reserved or kept for us in heaven to be revealed at the last day are a kingdom, an inheritance, or salvation, a hope, a dwelling or house equivalent to our new body, a place with many rooms, or a citizenship, a homeland or country, and a city, even the New Jerusalem. But what is prepared for us does not mean we will go there to enjoy them. And N.T. Wright uses the example of a father telling a son that I've got a lot of presents for you for Christmas. They're up in the cupboard. When Christmas comes, you don't have to go in the cupboard and play with them. I'll bring them out and give them to you in the living room. So the preparation in heaven is a pattern that guarantees that the future is in God's hands, but it's going to be manifest on the last day, revealed, unveiled. It's an apocalyptic pattern. So Paul's hope of the resurrection is clear from verses 1 to 4, when new bodies are being prepared by none other than God himself. And yet Paul also says he prefers to be away from the present body and at home with the Lord, presumably in heaven. So could it be that Paul has contradictory hopes? Does Paul long for the resurrection while shunning a disembodied state, being naked or unclothed, but also prefer a disembodied state to the present life? of the mortal body. Perhaps he has a hierarchy. The resurrected body, then a disembodied state in heaven, and then the present earthly body. But this way of reading Paul ignores what he said earlier in the previous chapter. And remember, chapter divisions are artificial constructs people put into the letters of Paul. It was originally a continuous letter. So near the end of chapter 4, Paul explains the basis of his hope, why he's not driven to despair in his tribulations and sufferings. And the reason Paul says he can faithfully live in the midst of suffering is that we know that the one who has raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and bring us with you into his presence. Notice, there is no separation here of resurrection and being in the presence of God with Christ. Not only does Paul look forward to the resurrection, but he conceives of being in a resurrected, embodied state in the Lord's presence. So being in the presence of the Lord in 414 is, if we read contextually, equivalent to being at home with the Lord in 58. There is no convincing reason to re separate the latter statement from Paul's hope of resurrection, except that we are habituated to read the text that way, and we ignore the previous chapter. In context, Paul is not speaking about being with Christ immediately after death. Rather, he's looking to the second coming, at which time we will be raised and be with Christ in the new creation. So a plain reading of this text in context suggests that being at home with the Lord is nothing other than Paul's expectation that we will dwell with Christ in the new creation. So it's not at all clear to me that this passage teaches an intermediate disembodied state as any part of Christian hope. Besides this text, the other text most often cited to support the intermediate state is Luke 23, 39 to 43. This is an account of Jesus' interaction with the criminal, typically called the thief, on the cross. When the criminal pleads, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom, Jesus answers, Truly, I tell you, today you'll be with me 
in paradise. Surely this teaches the intermediate state. Well, to understand what's going on here, we first have to address a common misunderstanding. It's the assumption that many readers have that the kingdom of verse 42 is equivalent to paradise in verse 43, and that both refer to the afterlife. However, neither the Gospels nor standard Jewish theology from the first century would ever interpret the kingdom of God as referring to heaven or the afterlife. The term speaks, rather, of God's restorative rule over the world when Israel and the nations will be subject in obedience to the will of the divine king. So the kingdom that Jesus will come into is nothing under that other than his messianic rule, representing the creator, to establish his rule over the nations at his return. It does not refer to life after death at all. That's the kingdom of God. What about paradise? Perhaps Jesus is telling the criminal that he doesn't have to wait for the eschaton when God's rule is established on earth because he'll already be in paradise with him today in the sense that he'll go directly to heaven at death. Of course, this hinges on the question, and it's not a simple question, of whether today goes grammatically with, I tell you today, or with, today you will be with me in paradise. And there's actually evidence putting it with the former. But I'll just accept for the sake of argument that it goes with the latter. That, but there's two complicating issues for interpreting this as meaning that the thief or the criminal will go to be with Jesus in heaven immediately after death. First of all, the Greek word parades, paradisos, paradise, is how the Septuagint translates the Hebrew word for garden, gan, in the Garden of Eden account in Genesis 2-3, to 12 times as I, as I find it. And according to the end of Genesis 3, when humanity is expelled from the garden, from paradise in the Septuagint, and denied access to the tree of life, with the way guarded by cherubim with a flaming sword, the point is that we no longer have access to the possibility of immortality, eating of the tree of life. Now, various second temple Jewish traditions developed about the inaccessibility of paradise, that is the Garden of Eden, and the Tree of Life. These traditions centered around the idea that God took the garden or paradise up into heaven. First of all, we have to understand that in the Bible, heaven is not an immaterial realm. Heaven is a sky. It's a metaphor for the transcendence of God. So it's taken away from us, so we can't get there. In fact, some of the, the texts suggest that it was taken up specifically to the top of a high mountain touching heaven or the sky. This assumes the ancient Jewish picture of the world with the mountains as the extremities that function as the pillars of heaven holding up the sky. So at the extremities of the earth where no one can reach, high up in heaven, that's where the tree of life is now. We have no access to it. So this is a world picture. With, with the Garden of Eden and the Tree of Life at the midpoint between earth and heaven. But what's the theological point? The theological point is that immortality is presently inaccessible, but will be revealed at the last day on earth. So speculation arose whether Enoch, whom God took, and Elijah, who was taken up to heaven, thereby entered paradise. But note that according to the speculation, they would have entered paradise in bodily form because they hadn't died this makes sense of the fact that paradise in the Bible refers to the primal earthly state of blessedness that we forfeited and not on any exegetical grounds to a disembodied heaven. Put simply, the core idea of paradise in scripture is the earthly blessedness that the human race lost with the fall, which is being prepared for the righteous to be enjoyed in the eschaton on a renewed earth. So we could easily add paradise to that list of things that God is preparing for us in the future. And this fits well with the book of Revelation, where Jesus promises the church at Ephesus, to everyone who conquers, I will give permission to eat from the tree of life that is in the paradise of our God. And then in chapters 21 and 22 of Revelation, as a new Jerusalem with the tree of life in it comes down out of heaven from God, we now have access to the tree of life and the gates are never closed. This is the fulfillment of that paradise, which was inaccessible before. But it's an earthly restoration of paradise. So there might be an argument for understanding the temporary location of paradise in heaven as part of what God is preparing for the saints. But paradise is not simply equivalent to heaven. More to the point, paradise, not in Jewish literature or the New Testament, is an immaterial place, the way heaven is often thought of in Christian theology.
even Origen of Alexandria, who clearly himself was a Platonist and had a bit of a, a, a allergic reaction to living on earth eternally, he had to acknowledge that paradise refers to some place situated under the earth that the saints will inherit. But of course, to moral progress, you'll ascend from the earth to heaven. He had to add that part in there. But he, had, he acknowledged paradise is earthly. So beyond the issue of the earthly concrete character of paradise, there is another question of what it might mean that the criminal would be with Jesus today. Because Jesus' assurance that they'd both be in paradise immediately at death, if that's what today means, confuses matters considerably. It's difficult to harmonize with the New Testament's own reckoning that Jesus was not raised until the third day and did not ascend to heaven for some time after that. Given this complication, Luke 23:42 might actually be used to support the notion that there is no consciousness in the, immediate, in the intermediate state, but that one moves subjectively simply from death to resurrection, which might make sense of Paul's expectation in 2 Corinthians 5 of the immediate presence of Christ at death, but in a risen form. And there are other texts that it can fit that very well too. To me, to live is Christ, to die is gain. I think that's about resurrection, not about an intermediate state. So perhaps Oscar Kuhlman is right about the intermediate state. We wait and the dead wait. Of course, the rhythm of time may be different for them than for the living, and in this way, the interim time may be shortened for them. Or as F.F. Bruce put it, the tension created by the postulated interval between death and resurrection might be relieved today if it were suggested that in the consciousness of the departed believer, there is no interval between dissolution and investiture, however long an interval might be measured by the calendar of earthbound human history. And of course, there are other texts that one could look at, and I haven't had time to do that. Maybe we can delve into some of them in our discussion time, but maybe we want to address the question of substance dualism, or perhaps more, most importantly, we want to think about the pastoral implications of these views. So much as I respect C.S. Lewis, I think he may have been wrong in his comment about the New Testament's casual and unemphatic ascent to personal survival at death. An N.T. Wright, a contemporary scholar of whom I have the utmost regard and whom I regard as a personal friend, may have conceded too much in his claim that Second Temple Judaism and the New Testament typically assumes an intermediate state. You can find that sporadically in Second Temple Judaism, but it's not universal, and I don't see it in the New Testament. So having studied the relevant text, I am surprised at how little evidence there actually is for this idea in the New Testament, which JP might say is really relevant to the question. I think it's somewhat relevant. It turns out that the Bible does not explicitly teach an intermediate state. In the end, I believe that it does not matter, but for a different reason. Authentic Christian hope does not depend on an intermediate state, and Christians do not need the notion of an immortal soul in order to guarantee personal continuity between present existence and future resurrection. The God who brought the universe into being is the guarantor of the eschatological future. In the memorable words of 2 Timothy 1 verse 12, which became the refrain of a very famous hymn, I know whom I have believed, and I'm persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. So I place my hope not in a theory about what happens after death, but in the God of Jesus Christ, the Lord of the universe, who is able to raise the dead and who has faithfully promised to renew heaven and earth. Whatever we think about the intermediate state, and I acknowledge that belief is dear to many Christians, scripture is clear that our genuine hope is not heaven as either a final destination or an intermediate state. Okay, Middleton, but maybe that's biblical, but will it preach? Well, I preached at my mother's funeral in 2010, my dad's funeral in 2012, most recently my mother-in-law's funeral this past September. I can testify that not only did I not appeal on those occasions to the idea of our dear beloved ones now being with Christ in heaven, I explicitly said this was not the authentic Christian hope. Instead, I focused on the hope of resurrection and new creation. Scripture, I was bold to proclaim, promises the redemption of the entire created order and understands human redemption as the restoration of full-bodied life in a new earth. This is nothing less than the coming to fruition of God's intent 
from the beginning, which even death cannot thwart. And when the funeral service this past September was over, two sisters of my mother-in-law, both my wife's aunts, both devout Christians, asked me if I'd preach the same message at their funerals when their time came, because they said it gave them hope. Thank you. All right, thank you both very much for your presentations. Uh, what we're going to do now is just to have a, a discussion uh, right here uh, between uh, both uh, uh, Dr. Moreland and Dr. Middleton, and then in about 10 minutes or so, we'll open it up to uh, questions from the floor. <coughs> uh, maybe to get this started, I, I have a question for uh, each of you, and I'll, I'll start with Dr. Moreland. Uh, by the way, I can, I can say this, I, I spent 23 years in Montana, so I can vouch <laughs> that uh, uh, no there are no circles. square circles there, so just, just so we are clear on that. Uh, Dr. Moreland, from a, a substance dualism perspective, how can we, you know, this is kind of a pastoral implication, how can we help people uh, keep the focus on the resurrection. I, I think of uh, Mercy Me song, I Can Only Imagine, and, mm -hmm. and, and I remember that came out when my father passed away, and, there, and, and, and he's a strong believer in, in the Lord Jesus, and you know, there, there were people talking about, oh, I can imagine that he's you know, walking the, 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 the streets of heaven, right. and, and, you know, and I think in the words of that song, you know, you know, dancing or, or falling before the Lord. So how can we, you know, that, that's an issue, I, I think, too, as we think about, you know, the terms uh, for soul in, in, in Scripture, both Nefesh and, and Suke, that, that they're often, that they're emphasizing a person. Uh, yeah, how do we keep people from, yes. uh, from minimizing well, that focus well, on Well, the heaven? quick answer is that we have to help people learn not to live with the for media gratification. And, uh, that's the general problem. It has nothing to do uh, with whether there's an intermediate state. The deeper question is, how can we get people to believe there's life after death to begin with? More and more people just think it's crazy because we're our bodies. And more and more Christians are gi actually giving up belief in life after death, though they might sign a doctrinal statement. They don't really believe it. And that's because they think science and naturalism have demonstrated it's not true. Now, there, uh, I do have two quick things to say, and, I, and, and Richard, I, have, uh, I really have found you to be a delightful person, but I really would like to see you reconsider your view because I think you're hurting an awful lot of people. I think that you're, you're telling them that what they've been taught all this time is not true, and there's no need for it, and I'll give you two reasons why. The first one is, that you keep, uh, you have acknowledged that your understanding of these texts uh, uh, are controversial and that there are other interpretations of them. One, you said it's not a simple question. So you must admit that there are people as good as you are that hold the traditional view. And as a result of that, the only time that you've expressed epistemic certainty was when you said that our core hope is the resurrection of the dead. But nobody who believes in the intermediate state denies that. Uh, when I went to school, my core hope was to get out of high school and get a diploma. But I still had to go through junior high school. So it doesn't follow from the fact that, that someone's core hope is X, that Y as a means to X isn't real. And my only point is that the intermediate state is not my hope. It is just what happens when we die. My hope is the resurrection of the dead. Um, and I think you're confusing what is essential to the person, namely the soul and not the body, with what is optimal. If I'm going to function optimally, I need to be re-embodied, but I can't exist without one. One other point, and I'll be quiet. Um, uh, you. Uh, your, your understanding of dualism is, again, I, I say, terribly flawed. 
because you claim that, you know, the dualist holds that the soul is the locus of personal identity, right? I'd like to ask you what your locus of personal identity is. But then you say it's the view that the soul is immortal. Dude, there is not a single dualist who believes in the intermediate state. I'd like you to cite one who believes that the soul exists on its own steam. Everybody who believes in a soul in an intermediate state says, our hope for immortality rests on God and God alone sustaining me in existence. So that is a straw man. And if that's true, then your two main points are taken away. The first one, what is our ultimate hope? No doubt that the New Testament emphasizes the resurrection at the final day. And dualism does not teach that our souls exist immortally on their own. God must sustain them. Thank you. you want me to address that? Yes, please address okay. that. So every text of scripture, you'll find more than one interpretation. That does not mean that I am uncertain about my interpretation. I'll argue my interpretation because I've got good reasons for it. Every philosophical question, there are different points of view. You're quite certain about your point of view, even though others will disagree. That's actually a fallacious argument, to say that simply because there are other points of view, we can't settle on something. So I've settled on something, but I know there are other points of view. Um, the question now of everyone who believes in an intermediate state who is a Christian still believes in the resurrection. Actually, empirically, I have found that not to be the case. I have found so many people that are focused on the intermediate state that the res resurrection is unimportant for them and does not animate their lives. But you can't and develop a view based upon what lay people think. Excuse me. But that, that's not the way, that's not a proper scholarly method. But I'm responding to what you claimed. So I'm my saying, cl my claim was the people who are in scholars that are dealing with this, not lay people. Oh. I don't get my uh, Christian doctrine from what lay people think. Uh, okay, I, I have a little different ahead, point sorry. of view. All right, go ahead. Um, because I believe that first of all, I'm a minister of Jesus Christ, and the church, body of Christ. Only secondarily am I a scholar, and a scholar cannot be my identity. So I'm not gonna actually get my points of view primarily from scholars. I'm gonna teach in the church. I've developed my theology from teaching in the church primarily. And so I have met enough people who really think that their hope is the intermediate state and that it then extends forever. I agree. And so that they, they may believe that there is a resurrection, but does it function in a theologically significant way? For me, a doctrine is not just something you believe intellectually. It's something that shapes your life and guides how you live. And so that's what I'm interested in. When you focus on the intermediate state, and maybe this is not your point, but when you do, it detracts you from living the full Christian life because it focuses you away from concrete issues in the real world. That's my experience in the church. It's also Tom Wright's experience. When you read, he's got analyses of that in his books. There's more I could say. I'm going to stop there so you can ask your question. Hey, Dr. Middleton, maybe a question for you. How would you respond to the argument that uh, the, the doctrine of our union with Christ makes it impossible for us to be uh, divided by Christ because we are in him? And that's, uh, that's an argument from Calvin Rowe, uh, Duke Divinity School, his book, One True Life. Uh, what would you say to that? What do you mean by that? I don't quite understand the question. Well, he says that, that our union with Christ, uh, that that doctrine makes it impossible for us to be divided from Christ, and he, he would take that, that, uh, that, that if we're not uh, present with the Lord, you know, as in substance dualism, that, that we've been divided from okay. him to death. So I actually think that at death, I go directly to resurrection. I think in my subjective experience, I will see the Lord immediately at death. But it's not an intermediate state. So you'll have your resurrection body then? I will go to the, to the final resurrection, to the eschaton. Yeah. Immediately? In my experience, it will be immediate. I, I, oh, no, well, th th that, that's a different thing. Well, that's all I can say. I can't go beyond that. Oh, oh, sure you can. I, I can't. Mean, Maybe you can, well, but I can't. You can, look at, you can look at the objectivity of the evidence. I mean, the simple fact is that phenomenal, something can be phenomenologically true. When I had an operation, I was out, and the next second I was recovering. So for, as far as I could tell, I had no operation. But there was other people who told me I did, and there was evidence that I did. And it seems to me that the New Testament teaches that there's one resurrection, 
and it's at the final day when everybody is going to be given a resurrected body. Now, surely you have to acknowledge that that has been the majority view, even today, of New Testament scholars, that there's one final uh, general resurrection, and if you get your resurrection body when you die, doesn't that make that final resurrection redundant? Actually, I'm saying that you go okay. to the final resurrection. Yeah, but you're talking, no, you're not. You, you're made, okay, Richard, you made two statements. The one is that you immediately get your resurrection body. That's an ontological claim. That's not what then I meant. You, then you that, said, well, me, it will not, seem to me. But, but if, you, if you're okay. debating someone, you have to ask them, did they mean that? Okay, what did you mean? I meant that subjectively, See, in my experience, I will get my resurrection body at death. Okay, what that happens is when you die? I do not know, and I don't need to know, well, because I trust that God has me in his hands. I, stop, that's, I know that. I'm not worried about that. But that is what I'm I, asking, what is it that can go around? People no, want no. to know the answer to this. There are people that are discussing let, let, let this. Let me dissent from this at, at the moment. So All right. I think that philosophical abstractions, like the kind of stuff you're dealing with, are second order. Like you just made? That, and that most of us don't need them for our faith. Well, you just made a philosophical abstraction. You said self-refuting. It would be really nice if you let, let me finish what I say. All right, I Thank will. Thank you so much, brother. I appreciate that. Um, so I have a meta statement about philosophical abstractions, and I think that's valid. I studied philosophy. I was interested in the theory of religious language. How do we speak of God with concrete terms and so on? But that is not what I preach in church, and that's not the ground of my faith. So the ground of my understanding and hope of what happens after death is not a theory of the person. It is God. No, let, we can get into the theory of what happens, analyze that, but that's secondary. And you cannot say that I must have that to have, to have hope, because I don't. I don't need it. That, that's what I would say. Okay. But, but there's validity to discussing this stuff. I don't deny it. Did I, I don't understand question? how in a secular culture, uh, my hope is in God too. There's no question that I'm hoping in God for me to live forever. But, but you, you're in a, we live in a culture where Barna demonstrated that more and more uh, people are leaving Christianity and, there, and the six reasons they gave were all intellectual. And they're having questions about the intelligibility of this. So, so the question is, there is a legitimate issue that people are asking about what, what is it that would make that me if I die and if in fact I cease to exist and if I don't, I'd like to know what it is that continues. And if I die and I'm, something's recreated, why is that me? And, and, and that's a legitimate question. People, so we don't choose the questions people ask. So we try to give them answers. Go ahead. I'll let Richard respond to that. But while he's doing that, we want to begin the Q&A. So if you have a question, and I want to encourage you to try to make it one question, maybe not a two or three or four part question. Uh, please uh, line up at, at the microphone uh, because we will end right at 1230. So of course people have all kinds of intellectual questions. But as any pastor knows, almost every intellectual question is a smokescreen for an existential question. And if you just answer an intellectual question, you're not, you don't get very far. You have to find out what's really troubling the person. And often, just being present with them, taking them seriously, uh, standing firm in your faith, is what gives people hope in Christianity, not answering the intellectual question. I have found that in my experience as a campus minister.